Hola, buenas tardes. Eh, en nombre de Fundación Corparte les damos la bienvenida eh, y eh, para conversar sobre no solamente sus creaciones, sino que también eh, quiénes son, qué hace eh, la compañía Danish Dance Theater, que es una de las compañías de danza contemporánea o danza teatro más importante, yo diría, que del mundo. Eh, para contextualizar un poco, quiero primero presentar a Pontus Lidberg, él es el director artístico de la compañía. Él desde el año 2018 es director de la compañía, eh, la que está compuesta por bailarines eh, de todo el mundo eh, y es una de las características también de, de la compañía. Pontus es coreógrafo, es director de cine y es bailarín. Eh, y uno de sus objetivos eh, que nos han podido transmitir desde la, desde la compañía es que la mezcla entre la danza y el cine eh, hace que uno encuentre nuevos lenguajes y formas creativas que hace del trabajo mucho más interesante y rico. Él nació en Estocolmo, estudió en el Royal Swedish Ballet, si es que mal no me equivoco, y bueno, también estudió diversas eh, asignaturas en la Universidad de Gotemburgo. Así que bienvenido Pontus, muchas gracias por conectarte desde Dinamarca eh, a las 9 de la noche. Nosotros estamos acá a las 3 de la tarde, en un, un día de invierno ya, estamos comenzando el, el frío por acá, por el hemisferio sur. Eh, recordarle también a todas las personas que nos están viendo que eh, al final eh, pueden enviar eh, todas las preguntas que tengan para que Pontus pueda responderles y podamos conversar un poquito más en detalle si surge alguna duda luego de, de nuestra conversación. Así que muchas gracias Pontus por estar aquí nuevamente y gracias a todo el equipo técnico que hace que este, este conversatorio eh, se pueda ver y se pueda disfrutar. Eh, voy a comenzar inmediatamente. Eh, primero, bueno, eh, queríamos conocer un poquito más eh, sobre la trayectoria de la compañía. Eh, nosotros conversábamos antes con Pontus que... que Danish Dance Theater es una de las compañías más importantes de, de Europa, de, bueno, de países nórdicos y por supuesto que de Dinamarca, pero quizás aquí en Chile y en el hemisferio sur no, no conocemos mucho el trabajo de la compañía. Entonces la primera pregunta es que nos cuente un poco más eh, de, de la compañía, del trabajo de la compañía y si han tenido alguna relación con América Latina en alguna ocasión. Gracias, Pontus. Sure, sure. Well, uh, thank you for having me. So uh, it's a pleasure. Um, yes, a Danish Dance Theatre just turned 40 years old last uh, fall uh, in October. So it was founded a little over 40 years ago. Um, at the time, you know, there wasn't really there, uh, a contemporary dance company in uh, Denmark. There was, of course, the Royal Danish Ballet, which is one of the oldest ballet companies in the world, but there wasn't a contemporary dance theater company. So it was uh, founded because the founders wanted something more, let's say, um, yeah, contemporary, up to date of our times. Now, uh, there have been a series of artistic directors and the company has grown, you know, from the beginnings were very humble. It was really, you know, people coming together with a passion. And then, you know, after, after a you know, long trajectory, it is now an institution in itself and uh, the largest contemporary dance company in uh, Denmark. So I've been here for four years and um, I continue the trajectory of uh, dance theater, I would say. I think the name of the company really says it all. It's uh, dance theater, meaning it's a kind of fusion of, uh, of uh, theater and dance physical theater that is. So, you know, I say that because contemporary dance, as you know, is, can be many different kinds of expressions, you know, with a very big range, it's really an umbrella term, uh, ranging from contemporary uh, conceptual installation work to uh, movement-based practices and, you know, everything in between. I mean, it's really a big, a big range. And uh, my focus really is on, on physical theater. So, um, Yes, I mean, I have not brought the company, well, that's not true. I've, I haven't brought the company to South America, but we have been to Cuba. And I have been to Cuba many times and worked there also in different contexts and performed there. And, uh, and have, I, it's a very, has a special place in my heart. 
And I will say that my work did tour South America a while ago now, but I was at the time, you know, much to my chagrin, I was in uh, China at the time I couldn't come. So it was toured without me. This was in 2009. So it's a little while ago. So it's about time, I think, that I arrive as well. I hope so. Um, let me let, please uh, enlighten me on the follow-up question because there was a there is a the first opening question is a big one. Sí, lo 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 que venía como separamos un poquito en dos la la pregunta es cuáles son las temáticas que que ustedes tratan en sus creaciones mm. eh, y cuáles han sido los caminos que han empleado para poder encontrar esos propios sellos creativos. Eh, nosotros en Fundación Corpartes uh -huh. trabajamos uh -huh. mucho desde los procesos creativos, eh, desde las visiones anteriores al, al resultado final. Entonces nos interesa mucho saber uh -huh. eso por parte de ustedes. Sure. Well, uh, I, yeah, I have a lot to say about that because I really forged my own path since a while ago. I came from classical ballet, I was a ballet dancer, but very early on I, I was, just, let's say, seeking something, I was searching something, and I, I tried different companies, different kinds of repertoire and so on, uh, more contemporary companies, but it was really only when I created myself that I felt that it was right. So I started making my own work very early. And in the beginning, you know, I had some initial success, but in the beginning it was really just me it was that was it i mean i had no money i had i had a studio sometimes um it so i had to create the work on myself with myself so the first years was really about developing a language uh of sorts uh on myself and then of course i started getting opportunities and the world took me very far um and eventually i ended up for now, at least in, in Copenhagen, Denmark. But that was a world journey of experiences. And also a lot of reflection, I would say, because for example, when I did my master's at uh, the University of Gothenburg, that was the time for me to reflect on what it is I do and uh, what it is I would like to do uh, moving forward. So it was a, a little bit of a check-in point, I would say, to do the master's. The topics, you know, I work with, with it's, it sounds maybe like a, a cliche but I really work with the human condition and what I mean by that is that I am very interested in the internal experience of being human what is it like to to live this life you know in all its complexities and sometimes you know I, I like to imagine that I I take a very very kind of universal point of view reference very far away and on this planet, there are all these things happening and people living their lives. And in a way, it's kind of doesn't really matter, but it does matter if you are there. You know, it matters for us. Uh, you know, the, in, in a truly universal perspective, what happens to our planet is kind of not consequential. I mean, it's just energy re redistributing itself like it does in the galaxies, you know, but it definitely matters to us. I mean, it matters a lot and even on a day-to-day -day basis things matter so i'm really interested in that i'm interested in you know this kind of tension between the mystery of being alive and the meaning that we ascribe to even everyday events and this is really like kind of the focus of my of of my work so um as such you know i have found also a friend in uh, cinema because in cinema uh, the, the, the possibilities of going deeper into that, I feel very satisfying. Mm. Then uh, to com complement the answer, I mean, the topics vary depending on the piece, you know, but I would say it's more like the topic of a piece is more like an entry point, but my universe remains the same. Yeah. Y nos podrías contus, contar un poco más cómo se relaciona el cine con, tu, con, con tus piezas, con tus coreografías y los montajes, que después bueno, vamos a hablar de Centauri y Siren, pero tienen mucho que ver con, lo, con los montajes escénicos también. 
Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, cinema is an interesting art form. I, I like, I really like to be able to do both live performances and cinema because they have some things in common, but they are also each other's uh, contradiction. Because uh, a live performance is really about a shared experience. When you go to see a performance, you are there, you know, you are there with, with, uh, with the performers. Whereas when you see a filmed performance or, a, or even more so a film, um, you know, it is kind of like watching a painting. You know, the painting doesn't change. What changes is you, if anything. So um, I, I find that, that, you know, that they're therefore quite different media. But cinema comes with a few options that are not really as easy, easy to pull off on stage. The most important one is that you can direct the eye of the viewer in a very specific way. You know, when you place dancers or a piece of theater onto the stage, the audiences choose their, they choose where they watch. I mean, you can direct it to a degree, of course, but I mean, they, they, you really, it's, you cannot control that. But in cinema, you can actually control what the audience sees. I mean, to a very large degree, which also means that you can quickly jump between different timelines. You know, things can happen in the past and in the future simultaneously, and you can kind of cut between the two and so on. So it opens up some possibilities that I think are very interesting. Um, yeah, but I, I really like working in both because I wouldn't, I wouldn't say one is better than the other. They're, they're different. They, yeah, they come with their different qualities and, and yeah, and limitations. Claro. Gracias, Pontus. Y ahora estaba pensando, y te estaba escuchando, eh, eh, y qu qu quisiera también preguntarte, que, que es un poco la, la primera parte de, de esta gran pregunta, eh, cu ¿cuántas personas componen esta compañía? ¿Cómo lo hacen ustedes para, para dividirse el trabajo? Eh, eh, para las personas que nos están viendo, ustedes están radicados en Copenhague, en Dinamarca, pero también viajan mucho, bueno, estuvimos un periodo de tiempo que estuvimos todos yes. en, en la casa, pero viajan mucho, eh, y como yo les comentaba al principio yes. cuando presenté a la compañía, eh, son una compañía que hay, eh, por lo que vi, personas de España, de, de, de los países nórdicos, mm -hmm. eh, es bien eh, variopinta de múltiples naciones, yes. eh, entonces saber un poquito más cómo está compuesta y cómo lo haces tú para compaginar todo, todo esto, que es, es mucho, eh, Y, y todo lo anterior que hablamos sobre los lenguajes mm -hmm. artísticos y la creación. Yes. Well, the company, as you've noticed, is composed of dancers from all over the world. And it's really from continents, you know, I mean, uh, ranging from many countries in Europe, North America, Australia, all sorts of places. And of course, you know, as in any dance company, there is a, there is, Sometimes people retire, other people come in, people transition and so on. So, it, but it keeps being very international. And I think that dance, especially contemporary dance, needs this international aspect uh, to a large degree because it's a small art form. And so we need to share, you know, we need, it's, we need to be global in a way because otherwise we risk getting insular. So I like to see it as if, you know, I bring the world to Denmark and I bring, um, you know, that's like, I bring dan I, dancers and uh, experiences from the world to Denmark, to the Danish audience. And I also do the reverse. I bring Denmark to the world. So it's, it's an exchange in that way. Now we are ranging from, let's say 11 to 12 dancers. Uh, sometimes it's a little less, sometimes it's, it's a little more, but around there, it depends a little bit on, on many factors, really. And then we have an admin uh, as well. So we're quite a small uh, company or medium sized, let's say. And we're big and small at the same time. But um, of course, I have picked these dancers because, uh, you know, I saw something in them that somehow resonated with what I wanted to do. So, so uh, um, nowadays when I create, you know, it's, it's really 
intended to be a dialogue, really. Back many years ago, when I had created my, you know, kind of a body of work, I was more in a way of a teacher that I taught, um, you know, what I had worked on myself. But now I'm more interested in dialogue. So what, you know, the mutuality of working with the dancers is really important to me. And if that mutuality is not there, then it's uh, less interesting for me, let's say. So, so um, the, in, in an ideal situation, um, it's really the work grows out of a dialogue that I direct, you could say. Um, you were also uh, talking about um, traveling and so on. It, you know, I do have another aspect to my career and my work, which is that I do still in a more limited way at the right now, but still I do make creations outside of, uh, of Copenhagen. And that's actually important but too, for similar reasons. It's important that I get uh, impressions that I can bring back. You know, that's very important. And uh, it's also part of the network that I keep uh, generating that I am out and about because otherwise it would be a very local thing. That would be fine too, it would just be different. Sí, es fantástico lo que dices, Pontus, porque me, me resuena, como lo dijiste tú también, eh, esto de compartir, de, de, más que de enseñar, yo creo que también es una característica muy de, nuestro, de los tiempos en los que estamos viviendo, por lo menos acá en Chile, de, de tratar por lo menos de, de, de compartir sí. y, de, y de que sea un aprendizaje bidireccional, más que de solamente ir a enseñar o a... A, a imponer algo quizás también, eh, sino que a colaborar. Eh, entonces tiene como una, una yes. amplitud muy, muy grande y nos hace, por lo menos acá, nos hace mucho sentido también en, en arte, cultura eh, y en todos los procesos que estamos viviendo acá a nivel cultural. Y, y, yes. y para enlazar esa yes. respuesta, para enlazar tu, tu respuesta que fue fantástica eh, y, y que nos resuena mucho acá también, eh, con, la, con la pregunta que, que sigue, eh, es, es cómo ustedes, nosotros acá en Chile, te comentaba antes de que empezáramos el, el, esta conversación, eh, recién la semana pasada eh, las salas de teatro o los centros culturales pudieron abrir sus aforos al 100%. Antes, hace dos semanas atrás, uh -huh. eh, no estábamos en esa situación y, y hace muy poquito, de hecho, eh, fines del año pasado que recién las salas de teatro y los espacios culturales pudieron abrir para, para recibir eh, personas en el fondo y poder mostrar las diferentes eh, actividades artísticas aquí en Santiago y en el resto de Chile. Entonces queríamos saber eh, cómo, cómo fue afectada desde el punto de vista positivo y también negativo la compañía durante la pandemia y cuál, es, cuál fue y cuál es la situación general de... de de, de las artes, de la cultura, de, de las, las compañías como ustedes allá en Dinamarca, que sabemos que está bastante distante lo que pasa acá, por eso queremos conocerlo también. Eh, eso. Yes, yes. Um, it's far away, but I would imagine that we share quite a few experiences actually. So I, I would say that in the beginning of the pandemic, nobody really knew what was in store. You know, nobody knew the timeline or the consequences or anything like that. And so we, Denmark closed quite early on, but we didn't know if that was going to be for one month, you know, or something like that, or five weeks, we didn't really know. The first lockdown that, that happened was in some way, it was stressful, but it was also a gift because we could somehow reflect a little bit. It gave an unexpected pause, I would say. I started drawing um because i need to be creative so i started you know another another kind of medium but then of course it became clear that this was not this was going to go on and in fact that the consequences were going to be much bigger and uh you know we have been fighting with the both the right to work because you know working from home is not really possible for a dance company um 
at least not the dance part the administration yes but you know the the dance part is not really possible so i have really fought to have the right to work and then the more complicated thing is like to perform and that goes you know that touches so many areas that have all been complicated because obviously we were not allowed to perform most of the time during this pandemic and when we were there were restrictions and so on and also even when there was theaters when theaters were open and there were restrictions some people and still today were afraid to come so even when we could have audiences not all everybody felt comfortable coming this is a big problem because we are performing arts institution i mean we we work not in a vacuum but we work in dialogue in direct dialogue with the audience and i my my stance on this is like this you know theater has existed for thousands of years i mean people were you know gathering in greece 2000 years ago watching plays you know and you know it's going to continue there's like this is you know theater is going to be, be around no i am not worried about that but the the problems that are now are multiple because one is that financially the whole art world suffered greatly from this pandemic i mean the lockdowns and the limitations have hit the art world harder than many other uh, industries and so we are now finding ourselves in a hopefully post pandemic situation where you know some of our networks and some of our usual partners are injured you can say and are still figuring out what to do and so you know it's really like a, i feel like a new beginning where we have to find uh, a way to exist that is adapted to a new situation um and i don't have answers there but you know i i do think that the live performance element is absolutely at the heart uh, of our activities and will always be for this reason i mentioned earlier that you know it's a social thing it's not just to watch art it's also the social uh, part of actually showing up you know and sharing having said that you know what the pandemic has taught us is that you can have experiences in other ways you know um basically through our computers or our screens or whatever and so my goal there is to deliver high quality experiences i see to me there's a you know there's a flip side to this which is that the amount of material that we are bombarded with on a daily basis is just too much you know we are we if we if we open our computers or our phones it's just too much material so i asked myself what can an art institution do and and my my wish is that we as a dance company can provide maybe not a bombardment of material but we can provide very high quality experiences in a more curated way so it's rather than just delivering things all the time we deliver things that are really well considered that you know really are thought through and that kind of are part of a bigger picture and so on so maybe that can be you know an alternative in a way which is more uh, yeah has more reflection and so on built into it um, that's my wish and my wish is to do both so that we can exist online in a more reflective curated way while also meeting a real so to speak phys uh, uh, so to speak physical audience in the theaters Gracias Pontus. También nos hace mucho sentido lo que nos Thank dice. You. Estamos eh, en las mismas reflexiones acá, porque también lo digital ha permitido que, por ejemplo, podamos estar conversando acá y podamos estar mostrando un trabajo maravilloso, yes. absolutamente creativo y, y distinto. Eh, entonces, eh, eh, nos hace mucho sentido también eh, valorar lo que viven ustedes allá y, y, y contraponerlo con lo que estamos viviendo todavía nosotros acá y creo que va a ser un tema en, en las artes y en la cultura por, por un buen tiempo eh, porque bueno eh, no sabemos qué va a suceder eh, mañana o, o, o el próximo mes 
Les quiero recordar a todas las personas que nos están viendo que pueden eh, hacer preguntas por el chat y las vamos a responder al final de esta conversación que ya queda poquito, se nos ha ido el tiempo muy rápido. Eh, y, y queríamos hacerte eh, Pontus, una, una pregunta ya más específica sobre las dos creaciones que, que, estamos, que, que tenemos mm. y que tenemos programadas en, en nuestro espacio virtual. Eh, y es que si nos puedes hablar un poquito más sobre Siren y Centaur, el, las dos creaciones eh, uh -huh. están en formato digital y que tienen un contenido altamente interesante. Eh, eso. Well, let's hope let's hope you find them interesting. Well, they are part of they're related actually. Um, you can find the relation in the title. So, uh, Siren and Centaur are both uh, liminal beings, liminal creatures from Greek mythology, and I love the word liminal which defines the space that is outside of the known boundaries. It's kind of in the in no man's land, you could say, or in the, you know, out, outside of the known. And a siren, we think of it as a kind of a mermaid, but really they were bird, women birds in Greek mythology. And the center, of course, is a man and a horse combination. These are neither man nor animal. They're, they're, they're between. They're neither, you know, they're not godlike, but they're also, I mean, they're more than mortal. They, you know, and um, so, so these siren and center are both uh, liminal beings. And this is a really good entry point, I think, for me to make work because both works explore the boundaries of, uh, of our experience. From there, they depart quite a lot. Um, siren is a work about desire. And I wanted to, to explore a piece of the myth of Ulysses. Ulysses, you know, in, in the Odyssey, he has lots of uh, adventures, many of which are quite archetypal of nature. And uh, the passage where he um, sails past the island of the Sirens uh, is super fascinating. He asks his crew to bind him to the mast and plug their ears uh, with wax so that he can experience the song of the siren while it not having it kill him. I find this metaphor very, uh, it hits me right at home because I have many times in my life experienced desire so strong that I risk losing myself. And in the myth, Uh, Ulysses understands something about that he cannot avoid the desire. He, but he also wants to live. He also wants to keep his, you know, he wants to keep his goal. His goal is to return home, as we know. You know, his ultimate goal is this Greek idea of nostos, of returning home. Uh, so he wants to both experience the desire and he wants to Uh, keep his ultimate destiny uh, and destination, which is to return home and not kill himself, basically by throwing himself into the water where the sirens are. So this is the theme of the piece. And then it's not an illustration of the myth at all. And in fact, I kind of queered the, uh, the piece to a large degree by not making it 100% um, you know, clear gender roles. So basically Ulysses and the siren is really part of the same figure. It's just different sides of the same coin. And what I mean by that is that these are qualities that we have inside us. I mean, we have Ulysses inside us and we have a siren inside us as well. So these are, you know, it's meant to be more of an, an exploration about these archetypal qualities as opposed to an illustration of the myth. Of course, there are pictures in the piece that, that, are, that are drawn from the source material. But if you expect a journey which is linear and follows the Odyssey, you won't find it. It's not really made like that. Um, I also would, I wanted to explore desire as a source of, uh, um, of creation. You know, 
if you think about the world, the world is full of monuments that have been made out of longing. I mean, think about the Taj Mahal, for example, this huge white monument built out of a strong longing and love and desire for another person. I mean, we as humans, it's we I mean, we, are, we, we kind of go crazy often in creativity, but the creativity is somehow is based on some kind of longing, some kind of yearning. The longing and the yearning is at the heart of the piece. So I, I've kind of explored longing and yearning as a source of creation. That's a siren. And then uh, two years after that, I created Centaur. And Centaur really is a very complex work. And, uh, you know, on the one hand, it is an exploration of artificial intelligence. And it really is because we used AI in the creation of the work. And an AI is also one of the performers. Every, like an, uh, an artificial intelligence installation is one of the performers in the work. And it's live online. So, so you know, it's unpredictable to a degree. Uh, it, um, it can, you know, it, it's, not, it's never the same. Each performance is different. Um, now, what I wanted to explore there was is how we relate to humanized technology. And this is something that I really, you know, think we should all think about because it's, it is already here and it's gonna grow. I mean, it's already in our phones, it's everywhere. So we often relate to technology that presents itself as having a human quality. But of course that is an illusion. There's nothing human about it at all. It's, it's all illusion, but it's very cleverly made because it's made to pull in certain strings that trigger certain feelings and emotions so that we feel that it is real, that it's, that it's, that it's a humanized uh, intelligence, but it's not. So the piece explores this, you know, what how do we relate to humanized technology, which can be very seductive and very manipulative? The other aspect that the piece explores is what I mentioned er early on in this talk, this kind of different perspectives of lives. You know, again, from a, from a personal experience and perspective, our lives are very important. You know, we have all of these things happen to us. People come in, in and out of our lives, we fall in love, there's betrayal, there's deceit, there is uh, life and death, there's disappointment, there is joy, you know, there's like su success and failure. I mean, this is daily, you know, our lives are like very full of these things. And to us, of course, they're very meaningful. This is really, our lives are kind of just a chain of these things. But from, a, from, a, from the perspective of an algorithm or a perspective from something which is very detached from this, we are just data points. We are only data. You know, our heartbreak and our, you know, joys and our sorrows and all of that, it's data. It's only data. It has no meaning. It is only more data, you know? And in fact, you can, this is also how humanized technology works. You know, we are presented with this thing that pretends to be relating to us, but it's not true. What is really happening is that we are giving data. We are just data to the other, to the receptor, right? So the piece explores this kind of thing. And I think the premise is really that, or my statement is that we are bi biological creatures and we are wired in certain ways. We have feelings and emotions. It's part of being human. And, uh, you know, this is not removable. It's like, it's like, that is how we live. And so we have to be very careful because when, when humanized technology enters our lives, we have a player that we feel, we perceive is one thing, even if it's not. So yeah, the piece is, is about that. 
And then it has many, many layers. I can talk for hours about this piece because, for example, we used uh, 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 machine learning to deconstruct the Greek uh, surviving tragedies. So we fed uh, the algorithm all of the Greek uh, tragedies that exist and taught it, or it taught itself really, to uh, write Greek tragedy. So the, the AI was writing you know, pages and pages and pages of Greek tragedy. New, new ones, you know, like based on the extant ones. And in the piece, the, the AI kind of creates these little dramatic moments that are really drawn from Greek mythology, but it, the AI has created them. Um, so so there's, there is that kind of deconstructed human material that is then put together in a new way. Yeah. I think I should stop there because I can talk. Uh, too, you know. <laughs> Estamos demasiado contentos de escucharte además porque, eh, bueno, una de las cosas de por qué eh, conversamos y, 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 y tenemos este, esta maravillosa obra en nuestra, en nuestra cartelera eh, digital es por lo mismo, es por esta, esta dicotomía ser humano, inteligencia artificial, la relación del ser humano con, con, lo, con la tecnología, con los con los elementos en el fondo que, que, no, que no son biológicos eh, y cómo se relaciona con, con el cuerpo, con la danza, con, con, eh, con, el, con algún medio de expresión que, nos, que, sea, que sea el biológico y no sea el, el formato eh, teléfono, el formato de inteligencia artificial. Y eso está súper interesante eh, porque es algo que creo, por lo menos acá en Chile, que sabemos que está ahí. Eh, pero que todavía no, no hemos podido decir, ok, es, esto está acá, ¿cómo nos enfrentamos a esto? Eh, ¿Esto es lo que viene? Right. ¿O esto es lo que ya está? ¿Y de qué manera construimos un, un mm. mundo y un planeta eh, en, que, en que el ser humano siga siendo eh, el, el centro de, de la emocionalidad y el centro de, de, de la creación también? Eh, justamente ayer leí un libro que decía yeah. que... que uno cree que, esto, que uno el teléfono lo controla, pero finalmente es al revés. Son estas cosas las que te controlan sí. a ti. Y, y todo eso eh, sí. tiene que ver con, con la relación con el cuerpo, con la relación con el otro, con la relación en sí. la sociedad. Eh, por tanto, eh, era una pieza uh -huh. que nos parecía y nos parece súper interesante de que se pueda ver y discutir. De, como tú decías, podríamos estar conversando... Uh -huh eternamente acá, porque es un, es un tema, y sobre todo ahora con, con la pandemia, que también nos dimos cuenta de tantas cosas que, que, se, que, yes. se, que se informatizaron o que se, se, se pusieron tras una pantalla, quedaron tras una pantalla, dejando al ser humano un poco encerrado también, ¿no? Eh, subyugado quizá. Eh, me están llegando algunas eh, preguntas acá para, para poder ir cerrando, porque sí. se nos pasó muy, muy rápido el tiempo y ha mm -hmm. estado muy interesante. Sí. Y allá en Suecia ya van a ser las 10 de la noche. <risa> eh, sí. quería, queríamos preguntar, acá tenemos dos preguntas que nos han llegado. Una, sí. sobre lo que nos contaste de... Eh, de lo que ocurrió en la pandemia, con la pandemia, a la, a la compañía y a tu creación. Eh, esto te, te vio, esta situación, preguntan acá, eh, te vio y te dio más una potencia creativa o, o realmente eh, te viste afectado por esto. Eh, ¿De qué manera pudiste sacar el lado positivo eh, a todo lo que ocurrió en, en, en la pandemia, a la compañía, al sector artístico, etcétera? Esa es la primera pregunta. Luego te, te, te hago otras que nos llegaron aquí. Ok, ok. Well, you know, I think certain aspects were not problematic and others have been very problematic. You know, like I said, on a personal level, I have no difficulty finding creative outputs. You know, I, I started, like I mentioned, I started drawing, I started writing. I mean, I, I, or I didn't start writing. I just continued writing. I mean, there's, there's lots of ways to keep working creatively for me. 
But the one problem that was very difficult was the sense of isolation that these lockdowns brought. You know, I, I um, tried to minimize it as much as possible. You know, we had some lockdowns were, let's say, total, as in you had to stay home. And then there were other lockdowns where you were advised to stay home, but I really fought hard for us to be able to meet in the studio because the isolation otherwise would have been too much, I think. You know, we are social creatures. You know, we this pandemic really presented a huge dilemma because on the one hand, nobody wanted to get sick or maybe even more so wanted somebody else to get sick. You know, let's say I was maybe not so afraid of COVID, but I was very afraid that my mother would get COVID. And so, you know, we were presented with this dilemma where we there was a real, let's say, threat to deal with. And at the same time, the solution was it was its own problem because I think human beings are just not made to be isolated. It's a very difficult thing to be. And there's only so much that you can do via talking on the phone or, or FaceTiming or, or something. I mean, because we are, again, we are biological creatures. We need touch. Touch is like essential, I think. So that part was very difficult to handle. And there were times where, we, where it was simply not possible to handle it because the restrictions were such that it wasn't possible. But um, yeah, and that was to me, uh, you know, a very negative influence that, yeah, was just not possible really to, to avoid. But uh, other things, you know, practical things, I usually see it this way, practical things can be solved. Existential things are more difficult. <laughs> So, you know, you can, you can, you can work on, on practical solutions. Uh, it's the existential ones that are difficult, <laughs> you know? So, so I think that the pandemic has presented us with both, you know? Mm. Gracias, Pontus. Y aquí te voy a hacer la última pregunta que recibimos. Eh, ya para cerrar yes. este conversatorio y agradecer a, a las personas que nos están saludando por el, por el chat, también que nos, dicen, nos dan las gracias y, y de la maravillosa oportunidad de poder conversar y escucharte. Eh, querían aquí saber también sobre, sobre tu trabajo eh, y, la, y la posibilidad yes. o la, la, las veces o las instancias que has podido trabajar en conjunto con otros artistas de otras disciplinas. ¿Y cómo has trabajado y cómo mezclas eh, eso, eso en tu propio trabajo y en tus propias creaciones? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I work with lots of different artists all the time. Mm. And, uh, you know, again, I think the meeting of different art forms is, is to me, very uh, important. And so, you know, of course, the obvious collaborators would be in music, composers and so on. Um, but also I've worked with a range of visual artists uh, of you know, one of my collaborators that I often return to is an animator. He makes animations, Jason Carpenter. Uh, when it comes to costume design, there's also a range. There are, of course, let's say more traditional costume designers who are artists in their own right. But I have also worked with visual artists who are not exactly costume designers, but who somehow through my work have kind of worked on, on uh, um, transforming their aesthetics into costumes, let's say. Um, having said that, I'm a very, let's say, multifaceted person myself. And I, 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 you know, I, I don't want to say that I'm a jack of all trades, but I'm interested in many things. And uh, I certainly have adventured into a lot of areas, including designing my, my own, uh, uh, you know, designing for my own work and uh, writing, you know, and 
all sorts of things. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answered the questions, but uh, you know, let's just say I'm always collaborating with somebody and I'm always trying something new. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Yo, yo creo que sí, Pontus, porque la, la, la pregunta iba a eso, a, al trabajo multidisciplinario, que cada vez más la, 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 cre yes. la actividad artística eh, y los creadores eh, se, se mezclan, quizás antes o quizás aquí en Chile más es como los actores, los bailarines, los right. artistas visuales exponen mm. una obra, en cambio... Eh, esto mismo que tú decías, este trabajo colaborativo y no tanto de enseñar, sino de, que, de agrupar y de trabajar en, en conjunto hace que, 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 sí. todo lo, que todas las disciplinas no, ya no sean una en particular, sino que se junten para construir algo en conjunto. Eh, creo que iba por sí. ahí la pregunta y, y es muy interesante lo que, lo que tú nos cuentas. Eh, nada, yo solamente agradecerte tu tiempo eh, estamos muy contentos de haber podido conversar, ha sido una conversación muy rápida, eh, muy interesante, hemos podido conocerte un, eh, un poquito más acá en Chile y conocer el trabajo de la compañía que es eh, maravilloso, eh, y los invitamos a todos y a todas las personas que nos están viendo y a los que van a ver este video, que seguramente van a ser bastantes luego de que lo, lo publiquemos en nuestras redes, eh, que pueden ver Siren Siren y Centaur, eh, hasta el 30 de abril en nuestras plataformas digitales, que se apuren porque es un material que es una joya, es, está muy bonito y es muy interesante. Agradecemos también a todas las personas que han visto este material, eh, hemos tenido importantes instituciones que, que han podido gozar y, y poder también reflexionar sobre esto, sobre todo, por ejemplo, pongo un ejemplo, Gendarmería de Chile, a lo largo de Chile han podido ver personas privadas de libertad, eh, este, este material que, que, que les ha eh, resonado bastante, sobre todo en los tiempos en los que estamos Amigo. viviendo. Así que te agradezco infinitamente, Pontus, Gracias. muchas gracias eh, a la compañía, a ti, eh, mucho éxito en lo que viene, ojalá que puedan venir a Chile, eh, sería maravilloso poder verlos en vivo, eh, y gracias sí, a todos. Ah, nosotros también, nos gustaría eh, infinitamente y bueno, y muchas gracias a todas las personas que nos están viendo, al equipo que hizo posible que esto funcionara desde Dinamarca a Santiago de Chile eh, y nos vemos eh, prontamente eh, en, en una nueva ocasión y, sí. y, y más que invitado a todas las actividades de Corparte así que muchas gracias Pontus Thank you. Bye. Chao Chao, chao Bye.